What up, what up? Welcome back to the channel. I'm OIJ and we are locked in. This is the recap for them season two, episode two, part of our eight days, the recaps. Now, episode one is setting us up. Now, I haven't seen anything like this in a while, and I'm liking the direction that we're going in. It's kind of a murder mystery slash some supernatural slash we don't know what the heck is going on. Don is doing her best to figure things out. We see that Edmund is trying to get some roles, and he's just kind of confused on which way he's going. And we still don't know who this quote unquote guy is that's causing all of this trauma. Now, before we jump into this and break down them season two, if you like this kind of content, murder mystery, something that's going to make you think, then definitely hit that subscribe button. Turn on your notification bell so you get something every time I upload and make sure you hit that like button. I'm on that road to 50,000 subscribers with enough talking. Let's jump into it. This is the recap of episode two of them. We start off episode two with the autopsy of Miss Mott. Now, when we go in here, we see all the disfigurements that happened to the body. We talk about the hands, the legs, the feet, the arms, everything. Now, the coroner said he had to re-break the bones, and he said he's never seen anything like this. Only a body would look like this after it got hit by like a train or something of that much force. McKinney is still going with the theory of multiple killers a.k.a. Malcolm and his friends, they got high, came back to the house, and they roughed her up. Now, the coroner is looking at him thinking, no, there's no way humans, especially 16-year-olds, are going to be able to do this. But in his mind, he just thinks that all black people do drugs and they're all angry black killers. Don, on the other hand, she's thinking of scenarios where this could happen. If someone was to do this and emit this much force to her body, they would have to take her from the scene put her in a trash compactor, bring her back, and not alert the kids or any of the neighbors. Now, the doctor, the coroner is saying when she died, it was because of a spinal cord. Once the spinal cord got broken, that's when it was over with. That's why there was no yelling, because the body and the vocal cords, they stopped contacting each other, and communication was all the way done. So for dying, this is bigger than just some little homicide that her partner McKinney is thinking, and she wants to figure this out. After they leave the coroner's office, a lot is racing through Don's mind. How did this happen? Why did this happen? Who did it? What was the reason behind it? Now, the whole time McKinney's in the vehicle, he's just eating, and we know how he feels about the black community. He ain't trying to hear none of that. He's trying to open this case and close this case as fast as possible. Now, at this point, Don, she gives up trying to even convince him Hey, these are people's lives here because she understands where McKinney is at. And this is what she was trying to tell the lieutenant when it came to working with him and McKinney taking the lead. She doesn't want to be here. We see Kel and he's in school. Now, Kel, he's sitting up under the bleachers and he's smoking a little bit of that good with this young woman. Now, she's saying she hates the police. And the reason she hates the police is because they keep harassing her family, specifically her cousin. Now, the reason Kel, he's getting a little unsettled and he's looking at her is because his mother is a detective. So when she's saying F the police, he can't agree with that for the simple fact that his mother is a police officer. Even though the police do some messed up things, he still knows that there's some good ones, specifically his mother. So he gets his drums, he gets up, and he leaves because he ain't trying to hear none of that bad talking about his mother. Don and McKinney show up to another crime scene. McKinney doesn't want anything to do with it because it has nothing to do with his case. But Don is saying, no, this is a random body around the same area. It might have something to do with Miss Mott. And let's see if anyone knows something because no one knows what happened to Miss Mott. Now, we know one thing about the community. There's a no snitching policy. No one's going to say anything, but they want the police to do their job. It doesn't make sense, but this is how the world works. We don't snitch but we also want the police to do their job. Well, it'd be a lot easier if you cooperate. Now, I don't condone snitching, but if it's your community, you might need to clean this up. Don goes over and start asking the residents, have y'all seen anything? And they're like, no, nah, we haven't seen anything. Do your job. It's the Southside Slayer. Now, there is someone out here catching bodies and no one knows who it is. But there's a guy that's watching through the crowd and we're looking at him and he kind of has an evilish grin on his face looking at Don. Once Don starts approaching him to ask him a question because he does look suspicious, all we hear him say is, it was him. 
He drops his bags and he takes off running. Now Don is chasing him and you hear him yelling, 5-0, 5-0. And everyone is looking to see what the hell is going on. The pursuit is on. Don is chasing after this suspicious character. He's running through people's apartments. She's trying to get through. She really wants to question him. He's jumping over rails, falling on hoods of cars. We even see the residents push Don down the stairs talking about, pig, get out of here. Because they don't want the police over here. It's, it's weird why it's like this, but they don't want the police over here. They don't cooperate with the police, and they definitely don't want the police to be arresting one of their resident members, someone that they're close with. Don shakes it off, continues pursuit, and follows Curtis back to his apartment complex. Now, when he gets in there, he picks up his child, and she's like, why were you running? He said he's scared. She said, if you would have just stopped, I could have talked to you. What are you scared of? And we start to get a little more details about what's been going on in the city. Now, he says, it's not you. He's watching us. And we're all thinking, who's watching us? By this point, McKinney and the rest of the police officers show up. And we know how he feels towards black people. So Don is saying, do not shoot. He has a baby. Do not shoot. McKinney's going crazy at this point. He starts attacking Curtis, kicking him, punching him, and he's asking him, where's the drugs? I know you're in here cooking because he assumed that every person is a drug dealer or a gangbanger. Now, Don picks up the baby. She's like, you got to stop. Another black officer comes in. He's like, sir, please, please stop. Curtis is on the ground, beat up, his eyes closed shut, and we're all looking at McKinney a little differently. Like, uh, McKinney, you might need to turn in your badge and your gun. Back over to Edmund, we see him sitting on the couch watching Ghostbusters, and he has a bag over his head. Now, we're not sure what he's doing, but we thought he was a little weird after he was prepping, looking like he was about to play an NFL game to just go out and dance in a pig outfit. Now, he's over here hyperventilating with this bag over his head, but he ends up getting a phone call, which could have potentially saved his life. Now, we're not sure what this phone call is about, but he's trying to gather up some information and he's saying he's called multiple times and no one's been able to help him. Now, this information seems like it's very important because he has it all documented. And if you look at the notepad, it shows every single date in each individual he talked to. Now, they're giving him the runaround and we all know how that can get. You call customer service. They try to connect you with someone else. They don't give you the right thing. They try to connect you with technical support and they don't know what they're talking about. And you just wasted 20 to 30 minutes of your life. So right now, Edmund, he's going through it. When Kale gets home, he looks like he has OCD. You see him counting the steps. One, two, three. He gets upstairs. One, two, three. Then he flickers the lights. One, two, three. So this might just be something that he has. And we see that he plays the drums a lot. So this is a foreshadowing for something else to come. But at this point, we aren't too sure. But it looks like he's double checking everything that's going on. Rhonda ends up calling our boy Edmund. And she's letting him know, I got a script that came across my desk. Now, this isn't the typical script that you would see. But she thinks it will be cool because it's a horror movie. And it's an audition for the villain. For the monster for the killer and she's saying there hasn't been many black people in these movies and she thinks it would be a good role for him now Edmund is hearing it and we've seen how he is he's kind of reserved kind of shy and he just doesn't have that tough gene in him now he's listening to it but he does want a role in acting and he's interested in Rhonda so at this point he's like no 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 I'll take that role but we got to get ourselves together in order to play this role at the house we see Don's mother, Athena, going into her room. And what does she discover? Some of the evidence. And she sees the photo of Miss Mott up under the sink. Now, of course, she doesn't know what's going on, but maybe she does have some insight. At this moment, we really don't know who knows what, who's seen what, who's heard what, or who has any suspicion of anything. So we're basically looking at this as a, a brand new case, and we're trying to dive deep in it also. Reggie Marks from the precinct, he's an attorney. Remember she told him to take a step back? Well, I told you there was some chemistry between the two, and they just didn't want it to be shown while they were on the clock or at work because he's an attorney, she's the detective, they work hand-in-hand -hand prosecuting these different cases. Well, they have them a little night out, a little bit of dinner, some wine, and you know how that can get one thing leads to another, and we see that their relationship is actually very close. 
They get into the pool with each other and they do what adults do. But we're going to be able to use Reggie a little bit later on. I'm just trying to figure out how and what direction is she going to go and take. It turns out this one time McKinney was correct and Curtis is a drug dealer. Up under the baby crib, there's a compartment. You move the rug back, you lift the floor up, and there's drugs, guns, money, and anything else you can think of that a dope boy would have. Now, he goes into the kitchen and he's cooking up. You got the baby in the high chair, but out of nowhere, you hear a knock on the door. Boom, boom, boom. Open up. LAPD. We know you're in there, Curtis. And he starts to run and throw everything away. He's trying to get rid of all evidence. He throws as much stuff away as possible, puts the baby in the crib, and then he drops down to his knees and puts his hands up because you can hear the police at the front door. If you don't open up, we know there's drugs in there. We're going to kick the door down. Well, once he sits in here for a couple minutes, it gets quiet. He doesn't hear anything, and he decides to go out and look out the front door, and he realizes that there's no police here. If there's no police here, who is making all of that noise? After Curtis checks the front door, he can hear his baby in the back crying a little bit. And when he goes back there, you can tell on his face he's a little nervous because it has his mind all messed up. He threw away all his drugs. There's no police here. So what did he hear? And when he goes to that back room where the baby is at, we start hearing the baby crying and all we hear is bones cracking. And this is the end of Curtis. Something, someone. Whatever it is, it got him when he went back into that room. The next morning, Don goes over and interviews Curtis's mother after he passed away. Now, she's upset because she feels like the police either had something to do with this or they weren't taking their job seriously and noticed that Curtis was scared yesterday. Now, it turns out she spoke to her son and he said that he was scared and someone was following him. Now, Don feels a little guilty for the simple fact that yesterday... When they came over there, he told her that someone is watching, someone is following, but she didn't help out. That's all because McKinney came in there kicking. When they go back to the office to talk to Lieutenant, Don is trying to bring up, hey, sir, this might be a serial killer. Now, Lieutenant doesn't want this kind of press or media coming up about around the city, scaring people. McKinney is saying that this is a personal vendetta. And Don is like, there's no way that this is a personal vendetta. This person is staging these bodies, and this is falling in line with a psychopath or a serial killer. Lieutenant says, listen, we're not going that route. You two continue to stay on this case, and don't mention serial to anybody. Until we find out what's going on, keep this hush, and we'll just treat these as two different homicides, and we're going to figure them out. Don... She has other plans. Not only is she dealing with what's going on at work, once she gets home, her son is in the living room watching the Rodney King beating. Remember when he was smoking with the girl, she said F the police. Now seeing this on tape, it had all of us. It had the world in shock knowing that this was happening, but now we have video evidence of it. So he's asking his mom what's going on. And she's saying, we can talk about this. There are some bad cops, but a majority of us are good and we can't change what they did but that's why i'm out here trying to make a change within the community now he doesn't want to hear this because he's seeing it it's a man that looks like him a black man being mistreated by the lapd later that night don goes upstairs and she makes a call to one of her connections now this connection is someone within the media and she tells them listen there's two homicides Miss Mott, and then there was another person. These two we believe are connected. We believe that there is a serial killer, the Southside Slayer, and we think that they're the one doing this. Now, the reporter is asking, okay, why haven't there been a press conference? She said, listen, leave my name out of this report and just report it. But we don't want that kind of press, and we don't want the whole community to be in a frenzy. But we do want this information out. And then Don hangs up the phone. Edmund is trying to get in character. He's trying to practice, practice, practice. He definitely wants to land this role. This might be an opportunity of a lifetime. Playing a villain, playing a monster, playing a killer. He's acting like he's Hulk Hogan. 
but he wants this job because he's an entertainer and he also wants to make Rhonda, you know, saying kind of impress her a little bit. He's doing a hell of a job and he's showing that he has range. And sometimes practice makes perfect. And we're slowly seeing the steps of him becoming a villain. He's painting his face. And at this moment, we hear him start to scream. And this is kind of like how the Joker started off in the movie. Remember, he was doing comedy. It wasn't really working. He was a clown. It wasn't really working. And at one point in life, you have a point where everything starts to turn for you. And this is where your villain art starts to begin. Kale wakes up in the middle of the night because he hears some stuff. And when he goes downstairs, he sees the TV is on, but it's kind of flickering. And it's the Rodney King tape that he was watching earlier. He looks on the couch and he sees his mom and she's smiling, watching what's going on TV. So he's like, mom, mom. But then when he turns the light on, she isn't there. So it has him wondering, uh, what am I seeing? He goes over to turn the TV off, but it's not turning off. The tape isn't turning off. So he unplugs the TV. But when he does that, he looks into the TV and he sees his reflection. And his reflection, his face is dismembered, disfigured. It looks like it's melted. And he is scared because he's feeling his face and he's looking at his face. The feeling don't match what he's seeing in the TV reflection. So he's scared as hell, and rightfully so, if you've seen this going down. We started to see Edmund become this villain. And when he gets to work, once he puts on his pig outfit, the door swings open and he sees a knife in the kitchen. Now, when he's in character, when he has this costume on, he walks out with the knife and everyone is running. Hide your kids, hide your wife. There is a pig with a knife. He comes out here and everyone is nervous. But while he's in this, he's watching to see how everyone's reacting to him and his presence. His supervisor is yelling at him. We already seen him messing up with the dancing portion. He takes his helmet off and he looks around and a tear drops from his eye. He's nervous because he didn't know what he was doing. He was caught up in the moment. And now he's seeing how everyone's reacting. You see a little grin. and He starts to realize like this might be my calling. Being a villain might just be what I'm prepared to do to take this to another level but he does get fired. All right, there you go. Episode two with them. This is some crazy stuff, but I'm liking what we're seeing here. What do you think about our boy Edmund? Is he becoming a villain or he's just tripping out right now? Let me know what you think. I'm Moda J. This is day two of eight episodes of them recaps. I'm on that road to 50,000 subscribers. So if you find this show interesting, Hey, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. I'm out.